All right, so this is my um, reading of the Lavender Town Syndrome Creepypasta. Um, just so you guys know what I um, went into in my last video. So here it is. During the first few days of the release of Pokemon Red and Green in Japan, back in February 27, 2000... 1996. Nah, yeah, that's pretty far off from any year in the 2000s. 1996. A peak of deaths appeared in the age group of 10 to 15. Oh, wait. The, the wiki uh, said it was 7 to 12. So was it 7 to 12 or 10 to 15? Never mind. The children were usually found dead through suicide, usually by hanging or jumping from heights. However, some were more odd. A few cases recorded children who began sawing off their limbs, others sticking their faces inside the oven, and choked themselves on their own fist, <laughs> shoving their arms down their own throat. The few children who were saved before killing themselves showed sporadic behavior. When asked why they were going to hurt themselves, they only answered in chaotic screams and scratched their own eyes. When showed what seemed to be the con connection to this attitude, did yeah, the Sovereign.exe has stopped working right there for a second, the Game Boy they had no response, but when combined with either Pokemon Red or Green, the screams would continue, and they would do their best to leave the room it was located in. This confirmed the authorities. This confirmed the authorities' suspicion. Okay, yeah, sorry, I, I can't English. That the game somehow had a connection to these children and the deaths. It was a strange case because many children who had the same. Yeah, I, I can't read. I'm sorry. I barely ever read anything. The only time I actually do is when I'm like finalizing my script. So I'm sorry. It was a strange case, because many children who had the same games did not show this behavior, but only a few. The police had no choice to, but to pursue this, since they had no other leads. Collecting all the cartridges these children had purchased, they kept them sealed away as strong evidence to look over later. They decided the first thing to do was to talk to the programmers themselves. The first person they met was the director of the original games, Satoshi Tajiri. When told about the deaths surrounding his games, he seemed slightly uneasy, but admitted nothing. He led them to the main programmers of the game, the people responsible for the actual content. Let me look up, is this uh, Satoshi guy actually, like, a real developer of the game? Yeah, apparently he is, actually, wow, okay. I want. I wonder what the legal ramifications were, like having a real person's name in, you know, this horror story. Uh, Attorney Tom. Attorney Tom. Legal, legal. You know, get on this. Is this legal? Can they get away with that? All right, I'll shut up. The detectives met Takanori Uta. One of the main programmers of the game. Unlike Satoshi, he did not seem uneasy, but very kept, explaining that it was possible to use something like a game to cause such deaths, and also bringing up the point that not at all the children were affected. He brushed it off as some kind of odd coincidence or mass hysteria. It seemed like he was hiding something, but he wasn't g giving away. Finally, he did say something interesting. Takanori had ho heard a ru who did, yeah, yeah. Takanori had who God damn it. Takanori had heard rumor going around that the music for Lavender Town, one of the locations in the game, had caused some children to go ill. It was only a rumor and had no real definite backup, but it was something to look into. He directed the detectives to Junichi Masuda. Uh, I uh, doing my research for this game, uh or this video. Uh, I f actually found out this guy was real, so again, you know, you have multiple people mentioned, real people mentioned in this fictional story, uh, most likely without their consent. Again, wonder what the legal ramifications of those are. Uh, yeah. He directed the detectives to Junichi Masuda, the music composer of the series. Masuda had also heard these rumors, but again said they had no evidence that the music was the cause. Even to prove a point, he played the exact song from the game 
completely through with no effects to anyone. The detective is nor Masada himself, feeling anything different or odd. Although they still have their suspicions of Masada and the music of Lavender Town, it seemed they had reached another dead end. God damn. Like, I'm reading off of um, knowyourmeme.com, and this, like, logo banner keeps on bobbing up. It's really freaking annoying. Going back to the cartridges they had seized from the homes of the children, they decided to take a slightly more direct look at the games. They knew that it was these games that gave the children the ill effects, so they took extreme caution. Popping in the cartridge and turning the console on, the game screen booted. The title screen appeared, and the option to continue or create a new game appeared. When they choose to continue a new game, stats of that game appeared. They saw the names of the children who had played usually Red or another simple game. Name! God damn it. However, the interesting thing was that the time played and the number of Pokemon they owned. On every game, the time was very low. I like how these cops are just, yeah, detectives, cops, private eye, I don't know like what their um, specific detective statuses are, it doesn't specify, but these cops are like going so far as to play the games. Uh, the ch kids played, uh, if that's proper police work um, in Japan, then so, so be it, I guess. Um, on every game, the time was very low, and all of them had only a single Pokemon in their inventory. They came to the stunning reality that it could not have been the music for Lavender Town that had caused such ill effects to the children. Since it was impossible to reach that part of the game in such a small amount of time, and with only one Pokemon in their inventory. This brought them to the conclusion that something early on in the game had to be the cause. If it wasn't the music nor the title screen, it had something... It had something to be within the few, few minutes of the game itself. They had no choice but to turn off the game now and go back to the programmers asking for a list of all the programmers from Takanori. They found, surprisingly, that one of the programmers had committed suicide shortly after the game was released. Well, you know, suicide rates in Japan... Uh, correlation doesn't equal causation, but... Uh, Alright, his name was Chiro Miura a very obscure programmer who had provided very little for the game. Even more interestingly, he had requested his name did not appear in the credits of the game, and so it was not. Looking over at the evidence found at Shiro's apartment, they found many notes written in bold marker. Most of it was crumbled or marked out, making it very difficult to read. The very few words they could find in the mess was do not enter, watch out, and come follow me in bold. The detective... Sorry, I've got like a mucus phlegm hairball thing in my throat. The few words they could find in the mess were... Oh, I already read that part, silly me. The detectives were unsure what these meant, but knew they had to have a connection. Further searching, they discovered Shiro was good friends with one of the map designers, Koji Nisino. And this was probably the only reason Shiro had given a part in making the game. Hold on, let me look at... This guy is real. Uh, yeah, d d there are pictures of him coming up, so I'm g gonna assume he's real. Uh, yeah. Again, another real person. This is a legal nightmare. Uh, to the original author of this pasta, be glad you remained anonymous. <laughs> Koji Nishino, since the release of the game, had locked himself in his apartment, barely leaving in the dark of night to fetch anything he might need. He told his friends and family he was mourning for his dear friend Shiro, but they didn't believe this, since Nishino had locked himself up the day the game was put in the stores, a few days before Shiro had killed himself. It was, fuck. It was troubling, but the authorities finally persuaded Nishino to sit down and speak with him. He looked as if he hadn't slept in days, dark rings under his eyes, he stung. His nails had grown black and his hair was greasy, sticking to his forehead and... What? 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 How? Sticking to his forehead and neck. 
what uh, I'm not so sure uh, what uh, okay first off the same hair oh well according to his pictures he's bald he doesn't even have hair but uh, oh, oh I'm not trying to make sense of this anymore okay he spoke in stutters and murmurs but at least he had something to say when asked if he knew anything about the children who had died after exposure of the game, and if it had any connection to the game, he answered them seemingly carefully, choosing his words thoughtfully. Th yeah, thoughtfully. Let's, let's just read it at that, okay? Thoughtfully, before answering. He told them that his friend Shiro had an interesting idea with the game, something he had wanted to try since he heard the project was starting. Nishino himself knew Takanori, the director and main programmer, for a long time so he could easily get a mediocre programmer in on the project with a little persuasion. It seemed Chiro had convinced Nishino to get him on the project and it had worked. The chapter, yeah, if you were express, yeah, see, I cannot talk. If you were expecting some sort of, like, horror story, um, what, uh, it's saying, uh, 11 minutes and 20 seconds, give or take, into this, uh, my reading of the story, and it's just some, like, a workplace programmer politics, uh, intertwined with the detective investigation. It's not creepy yet, but, okay. The detectives knew they were onto something. This unknown obscure programmer... <laughs> She had something to do with it, something. They asked what she... You can already tell from the tone of my voice <laughs> that this... Um, I am not overly enthused by this story. I'm really not. <sighs> they asked what Shiro's idea was. That's why, was why he so badly wanted to have a part in making this children's game. <sighs> Nishino told them that Shiro never told him much about it, other than a few details about every now and then. He wanted to insert a special Pokemon in the game, one completely different from all the others. It would serve as an extra... a kind of out-of-place thrill for the player. It wasn't, however, missing... Missing number? It couldn't be. With the gameplay time recorded on the cartridges, it was impossible for the children to have time to meet that Pokemon. Nishino, throughout the entire conversation, seemed to break down even more and more with that every question. I wonder if it's, um, slam... <laughs> if this somehow negatively uh, affects anybody's reputation in real life, negatively, um, I wonder if that counts as, um slander, or I guess libel if it's written, but I, I don't know. I'm anything but a lawyer. I couldn't stand eight more years of school. Um, you see, you know, throughout the entire conversation, yeah, seemed to break down more and more with every question. The detectives pushed him to more and more, searching through his mind for any and every scrap of knowledge that this man had no game. And Shiro, Shiro's intentions, okay, look, I'm just gonna skip over tons of this story because we're almost 14 minutes into this and I want to be done with this story alright my family I'll follow you he pulled the trigger bang yeah just bang one sentence one capital letter at the beginning you know nice automatopoeia his brain spread the wall spread the wall so his brains are uh, taking it upon themselves to somehow get each and every neuron to move the wall? Uh, uh, fucking syntax. Okay. His brains spread the wall as he fell to the ground, dead. It was a few days before the body was discovered. It lay on the floor, blood everywhere. In one hand held an empty gun, the other was a classic Game Boy Pokemon with Pokemon Red on the back. The battery had long died and only an empty black screen was left. This was the final murder that the remaining authorities would allow. The last detective who was ever a part of this case personally carried all 104 cartridges, cartridges away and burned them all, making sure not a single one survived. 
there would taunt there would taunt no more okay however this is not the end of the story oh please god T- damn <sighs> that's literally what it says it says it's not the end of the story the code was said to have survived and it was even passed on to another language other language versions of the games you mean like programming language or the actual you know phonetic language it's programmed in anyway if you have an old pokemon game you can replace the cartridge in the back of the classic game boy turn on the system and roll the wheel who knows maybe you'll learn the secret for yourself yeah no okay um we're done here i hope you like this reading but done here